Welcome to BizMag podcast and Global HR Virtual Summit 2022. Today's our keynote speaker is Caroline Foster, all the way from United Kingdom. I will introduce Caroline before welcoming her on our show today uh, to my audience who comprises of startup owners, business owners, HR executives, and business students. Caroline Foster is an established chief business People Officer and Human Capital Transformation Director, who has worked extensively across the domestic and international market in FTSC, NASDAQ, Fortune 500, and PE invested businesses. She is passionate about elevating lifelong and world class employee experience and is an advocate with an increasing presence on the lecture circuit as a pioneer of social mobility diversity, equity, and inclusion. She is known for her passion, transparency, and deeply ethical practice. She is a chartered fellow of CIPD and has a postgraduate degree in people and organizational development. She is married with one teenage son and describes him as the greatest love of her life and the reason why she does what she does. Welcome. Caroline to our show once again. It's our honor to have you here on this summit as one of the greatest HR leaders from the world. Okay, good, uh, good afternoon, good evening, and uh, a warm welcome to the engagement dilemma. Um, I have a few slides that I would uh, welcome sharing uh, with you, which I suggest that we go straight um, into. But um, as we do that, we know from empirical evidence around the world that more than 65% of global employees report they are disengaged from their employers on a year by year basis. And there is an abundance of data, particularly from um, business schools and um, research, research and consulting organizations, Gallup in particular. And this presents a compelling and uh, very interesting challenge for our, our HR profession and for line leaders across the, the globe. And these are some of the things that I would, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that I would like to, uh, to talk through um, right now. So um, could we see the slides, please? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the... Um, You can uh, see the slides. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, I can see yeah. those. Uh, thank you. So if we can move to the, the second slide, please. Sure. Thank you. Okay, so this is an engagement model that I have um, used very often in my work in um, interim consulting and uh, is focused uh, in developing a, uh, a really uh, compelling engagement index. And the first um, area looks at uh, what I call leadership bench or leadership bench strengths, because <clears throat> there are no doubts whatsoever that the, um, the, the leadership skills and particularly the types of mindset and personality um, that exist in, um, in leadership in highly um, engaged organizations is focused in building a broader repertoire of authenticity, of uh, high values and um, ethical practice, of um, delivering and bringing in courage um, into the leadership mandate, of being honest um, and authentic and to be uh, somebody of high integrity. And these are very often personality Sorry. traits. It's okay. These are very often personality traits that we simply cannot manufacture. And the experts suggest that they are typically um, personality characteristics that are developed through nature and particularly during our formative years between the, um, the, the moment of birth and, and broadly up to the age of seven years. So in contrast, where there may be leadership characteristics that are opposite to this, then very often we will um, experience what is known as toxic organizations and in those types of organizations we will often see higher labor turnover 
lower levels of attrition and uh, a, a generally unhappy workforce. Um, the second engagement model that I've built is focused upon cost management because it is um, uh, an assumption in the HR profession and across our leadership populations that putting a value to engagement is something that is very difficult to do, when in reality, it's really not that problematic. And um, the, uh, the high performing chief executives certainly who I've worked with in my career will always carry the engagement index of the organization that they're leading in addition to the EBITDA and the income and revenue and other harder fiscal measures of um, organizational performance. And I would propose that our engagement index is probably one of the most critical metrics emerging from uh, the human resources profession. Um, I also recommend that um, across our profession, and particularly with um, our HR leaders, um, that our, um, our, our, our responsibilities and our challenges often include migrating what is um, typically the greatest cost in organisations, which is, of course, the cost of people, and migrating that cost through the work that we do and the value that we add to ensure that that greatest cost ultimately becomes the organization's greatest asset. The third area of my engagement model, I've called culture, climate and chemistry. And this of course requires lifelong crafting and carefully building the DNA, the heart of the organization that ultimately enables and empowers people um, across that um, organization to collaborate, to innovate and to truly work at their best. And again, some of the external evidence that we see um, across the engagement dilemma suggests that um, organizations that work together to define a common and shared purpose, um, a renewed um, and compelling partnership and a shared sense of passion are those organizations that are likely to be thriving and more likely to be highly engaged. And the fourth and final area of my model strongly correlates to all um, other, and particularly to cost management. And this looks at the return on investment. And what I'm suggesting here, in addition to ROI, is to think about the future requirements of the organisations that we work in. So the, uh, their cost management, their service delivery, models, the customer um, engagement strategies, the different channels and routes to uh, building income and revenue and profitability, and the requisite skills, the behaviours, the knowledge and the mindsets that are required and to start working on the design and the infrastructure of those organisations and building today what is required for tomorrow. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so here we have um, some opportunities around the human capital advantage, which is essentially the uh, the, the ultimate cost of um, of um, organisations through uh, th through people um, opportunities, and you can see in the first quadrant. Um, there is, um, th there is um, evidence and research, particularly from one of the largest studies of um, employee engagement around the world that was conducted by Gallup in 2013. And although it is some years ago now, there has not, to my knowledge, been another piece of research as broad and as deep uh, into um, uh, uh, kind of capitalising the, the, the cost of the um, of the correlations between um, highly engaged organizations and their productivity and profitability. And that research at the time, which was the largest to date around the world, studied um, Fortune 1000 organizations. 
there were um, more than 196,000 employees that took part in that survey with um, approximately 32 million respondents completing the, um, uh, the, the research uh, questionnaires and data. And what that evidence proved beyond any doubt, and wait for this folks, because this really can be life-changing, is that for every one percentage point increase in the organization's human capital index, it presents up to $1 million of top line opportunity gain. And of course, we know that top line gain is largely around um, mobilizing um, services and resources and um, business gains that aren't currently in existence in that organization. And there is absolutely no doubt that the more engaged organizations are, the more profitable they become. The second area um, in, in, in the second quadrant um, reported a staggering $605 billion productivity gains um, um, across those organizations, um, and particularly in, um, in areas of, sorry, we'll just go, uh, go back to the previous slide. Thank you. Um, particularly um, in areas of increasing attendance and sub subsequently reducing the cost of absence, um, significantly increasing service delivery across you know, various client bases, um, elevating the customer impact and the, uh, and the financial returns that that brings, um, and of course, um, hugely increasing retention and all of those factors mixed together um, uh, illustrated uh, th that degree of productivity gain, which is simply, you know, ma magnificent opportunity and, and, and represents, um, in, in my uh, judgment, why engagement really should be a lifelong area of focus of both human resources professionals and leadership populations. Um, in the third quadrant, um, we saw from the Gallup research a maximum of a 147% um, increase in the, uh, it, basically in the, in the earnings per share, so in the share value of, of all of those uh, listed organizations, uh, we saw that, that kind of increase. And um, in particular, it was uh, drawn out that for, on average, for every 9.3 engaged employees, versus every disengaged employee experience, it brought about a maximum uh, increase in uh, share value of 147%. And then finally, remaining quadrant suggested um, on average um, an increase of 25% in, um, in, in bottom line, uh, and that's through growing market share um, building the pipeline for new business, and of course, holding on to the tacit knowledge and the acquisition of knowledge, and utilizing that knowledge um, into, um, into profitability. So um, if there is um, anything which I would urge you to, uh, to remember from my presentation, it is about the fiscal opportunities of, um, of the more highly engaged organizations, the more productive, the more compelling, the more profitable, and the more sustainable those organizations are going to be. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Um, so I've, um, I've suggested a, a kind of a map which represents uh, the globe, because I do think that both our HR challenge and our leadership challenge um, is global. You heard me suggest a few minutes ago that I recommend this work is lifelong. Um, I don't think it is a, fix, a quick fix. I think there are a number of areas across the engagement dilemma that we can generate some material results. But broadly, it's a, it's a lifelong challenge that requires a really compelling people vision and people strategy that is hardwired into the DNA of the business strategy and the entire organizations that we work in. 
Um, the second area is to really um, elevate the, um, the, the opportunities of, of, of digging under the bonnet and going broader and deeper into people data, metrics and analytics, because without those data insights, we are not um, readily able um, in our profession to be able to add value today and then to start creating value for tomorrow and right across that, that labour mix and particularly in um, engagement and the correlation of engagement across um, attendance, across happiness, across um, productivity, um, across profitability, um, across top line uh, gain and across the, the um, direct correlation of that leadership bench. Um, there are a number of opportunities in which to illustrate and to clearly articulate um, what that data is telling us and to then use that data through the production of leadership scorecards. Um, I've worked in many organisations where we've implemented the engagement index by line leader um, and then latterly um, put that into the competency frameworks, into the business strategies into the KPIs at the coalface um, and then um, sometimes in organisations um, into the heart of the pay and compensation model so that ultimately there are opportunities for discriminating um, against leadership compensation of those leaders who are really mobilising highly engaged areas of their business versus those who um, take little or no action at all. Um, the other um, area I've called the DNA of the organisation, and this relates um, earlier to the, the culture, the chemistry um, and the wiring of the organisation. And there are some very compelling um, opportunities to create cultures and operating climates that meet the requirements of, um, of, of all aspects of our work force and we know all of us around the globe have a shared experience of living through a global pandemic and this pandemic has obliterated the world of work and the model of work more so since the um, age of industrial revolution and we know now that um, the genie has been let out of the bottle and an increasing number of global workers want and expect more hybrid working arrangements, more flexible working arrangements, and more agile ways of working that can accommodate the multiple complex complexities of, of how we live our lives and the pushes and pulls um, of how we balance our lives in and out of work. We also know that there, um, in certain parts of the world, and particularly in my own country in the United Kingdom, there is the highest population of 50 plus workers um, right now in the UK since records began. And of course, the requirements of, of, of that population of workers is going to be very different, for example, to Generation Z. And our Generation Z are um, my child who, who, who is 16, um, any of our children who are largely under the age of kind of 25, this group, um, have very often a different set of requirements to what the baby boomers may have expected um, several uh, decades ago. And Generation Z in particular bring more purpose and greater altruism to the, um, to the working agenda. And we know that there are much greater appetites for things like climate change, um, for things like um, Black Lives Matter, um, and um, other opportunities that can start to um, improve over time uh, the, the organisation itself and the um, kind of societies and the uh, different uh, segments that, um, that our organisation serve and ultimately to improve our world for the better. We also know that mental health, um, for example, um, is in a state of emergency across many different jurisdiction, jurisdictions, countries and, and continents. And the COVID-19 global pandemic 
has made um, that situation far worse, which in turn has put a spotlight on um, the health um, and the welfare of, um, of, of our people. And all of these factors are intricately involved um, and correlated to the leadership, sorry, the, to the engagement um, dilemma. So uh, next slide, please. this slide is finished. <laughs> yeah, please carry on. Uh, th th thank you so much. Um, and um, I, I, this slide, you know, it is a simple illustration of something which, uh, you know, is, is known by working professionals around the world. It's been in evidence over many decades. And this perhaps can be, you know, a useful starting point for those professionals who, um, who, who, who don't currently have um, an engagement index using something like a SWOT analysis or perhaps a PESTEL analysis, which would look uh, more broadly at, um, at other external factors, but um, to, um, to, to work through, through, through that model um, in an attempt to, uh, to, to prioritize the, um, the areas uh, to be addressed um, and of course the areas of, of greatest impact. And what I would suggest around things like SWOT analysis and, um, and um, people metrics and analytics is that um, there is a stark contrast in engagement surveys um, to measure things. And it's not just certain things that we want to be focusing upon. We need to ensure in our engagement surveys and our engagement inventories that we are focusing upon and addressing the right um, categories and the right um, data in which to elevate that cradle to grave employee experience. And it's ultimately that that sits behind the human capital advantage and increasing the, the, the number of engaged um, uh, employees in our organizations because the more robust that cradle to grave employee experience, uh, the more compelling those organizations are to want to be a part of and to stay there and to do great work and to create momentum and magic through the course of our work in which to increase um, investor return, increase shareholder value, deliver upon the mission, the vision, the strategy, um, and to ensure that um, all customers are, um, are satisfied in that um, customer relationship experience. Okay, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Vanita. So, um, in, in broader forums, there is a QA. and a uh, For those of you that perhaps um, uh, would like to make contact with me, please feel free to do that. You'll find me on LinkedIn. Um, my name is Caroline Foster. Um, I've delivered this presentation um, uh, with Caroline Foster Consulting. Um, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Vanita for inviting me as a speaker and to give me this opportunity. And I would welcome any offline um, um, interaction and would be delighted to uh, answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a delight to spend this time with you.